If you would, open up to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Over the course of the, the previous weeks, going through the story that started way back in, in Acts chapter 3 about the man who was, who was born lame and how through the power that Jesus gave through John and Peter that, that he would be able to walk again. And as he came uh, leaping up and, and walking up, to be able to climb up those stairs praising God, having this ability, and at the same time, to, to have all these people just surround them. And he talks about the lame man just kind of clinging to Peter and John. And then for Peter and John to be able to preach Jesus, even in the temple, and to be able to see, to see how that kind of unfolds. And as part of that, of course, Peter and John in the day arrested and being there in, imprisoned, and the next day, they get to stand before the Sanhedrin, a bunch of untrained, uneducated men who really confound the, the council that's there and gets to basically convict the hearts of those men, at least trying to, about what they had, what they had done to Jesus and crucifying him and disowning him. And so, of course, they are let go free. There's, they have no basis on which to, to punish them. And so they're let go, and they finally get back to the, the other saints that are there. And the prayer that we've, we went through two weeks ago, basically verses uh, 23 through, through 30, about what was offered when they lifted up their voices and prayed to God and recognized God as the creator of the universe and everything within it, and to understand that Jesus now reigns and sits on the throne. And to really just ask for a couple of things in verse 29 and 30. He says, And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. Notice they don't say, take note of their threats and keep us from any kind of difficulty. They say, will you give us boldness that even when we're being threatened, that we will still honor and do what is right and be able to preach and teach about Jesus. Then in verse 30, he says, While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. He says, now Will you continue to confirm the words that we're saying about your son? Whether it be miracles, uh, think about signs, wonders. He says, and if you notice the way that they, they make the statement, take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Notice they always want to point back to Jesus. They don't want it to be anything about them. And of course, if you've ever had a time in your life where you pray about something and then you hang up, uh, you finish the prayer, and then all of a sudden, within just a few minutes or, or hours, the phone rings and you kind of get your answer pretty quick. Those are kind of amazing things whenever things come together that fast. Well, verse 31 says, When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. You think about having an earthquake. Think that would have your attention? Who stands in control of those things? Well, the Creator. He says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And sure enough, that's what they do. They go out and they speak the word of God with this boldness. And don't think about that means that they're confrontational or they're uh, high and mighty. They're going to say it, even if it means they're met with opposition, even if it means being put in prison. You, you'll find it as we continue through Acts 5, probably not this week, but as you go forward. They're even going to rejoice at the fact that they can suffer shame for the name of Jesus. I think that's just one of the more mar marvelous passages. Go ahead. That's really not the way we typically see things when we suffer for Jesus, of going can't believe I'm worthy to suffer shame for him. Now, this boldness comes on them, and this is exactly what they prayed for. I mean, realize the things that we're going to go through, hopefully through, I hope we get through the end of chapter 4 and really a pretty good distance into chapter 5 this morning, to really grasp a hold 
look at what they prayed for, and then look at what unfolds. Because they know who's bringing these things about, and they know it's not them. So, look at verse 32. It says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Notice what happened among the congregations of, of the saints in Jerusalem. Right, keep in mind, most of them are still in Jerusalem. Even though Pentecost happened where people were from all over, there's 3,000, 5,000 believed and were baptized, and some of them go right back home. But there's a pretty big group that stay there in Jerusalem, just according to the plan that, that Jesus told them way back in chapter 1. He says, it's going to start in Jerusalem, Judea, which is the region where Jerusalem is, uh, it says Samaria, you know, about really reaching out to even those who are not pure-blooded Jews, and then it's going to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's going to go to everybody. So here they are, vast majority still in Jerusalem, it seems, and to go, here they are, and what happens among these saints? How are they, how are they functioning? Same mindset. I mean, this is, this is not typical language that we use. I mean, we, we do sometimes say, you know, these people are of one heart. They have one motive together. And then, but then it adds in, not only are they of one heart, they're also of one soul. Now, can you be more tightly woven together than to be of one soul? And it's not the literal idea that all of a sudden souls are combined. It's not like, okay, well, your soul and my soul are together in this. Um, typically, that's kind of language that we talk about in marriage. Like, we really become one. But realize that doesn't mean it's always on the same page. But to go hear these people, and the only way that Luke knows to describe it, being inspired by the Spirit of God, to go... It didn't really matter to them that they're being persecuted. It didn't change their heart. It didn't change their motives. They're all together in this. And they go, we're of one heart and soul. And then he says, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. You go, it's all the same. They didn't go, well, we're all the same on spiritual matters. But when it comes to physical things, we're completely different. They didn't do that. They're like, you know what? If you need something, it's yours. It's not mine. And is that really the way that we see our, our physical things in terms of clothes, you know, maybe where you live, what you drive, you know, all those things. Do we go, look, this is mine. That wasn't their mindset. They said, it's the Lord's, and if I can use it, if it can be utilized by somebody else who needs it, it's theirs. It's all together. This is so far against the way people typically think um, of what's there. I, I always found it, I find it interesting every time I've opened a, a bank account through my life. There's two questions that always hit me kind of funny. Um, one of them is, uh, can anybody deposit money into this account? Can you guess what my answer always is? Yes. It, it requires no special ID, nothing whatsoever. If you want to deposit in this account, don't let anything hold you back. But then they always ask another question. Can anybody take money out of your account? Well, that's where the list gets a whole lot smaller. But you realize... For these people, they're going, we're all one in this. One heart, one soul, even physically to go, we're all one in this. And realize how unique that is. Now, he's going to spend basically the rest of chapter 4 and the first 11 verses of chapter 5 illustrating these things and showing what happens when you're not of one heart and one soul. Now, 
verse 33. He says, and with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and abundant grace was upon them all. Remember what they prayed for. They said back in, in verse 30, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Did God grant that request? And then notice the way he says, and it's not just with power. He says, this is with great power. He says, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They're apostles. And of course, one of the requirements to be an apostle was you had to see the resurrected Christ. That's why Matthias got added in there in Acts chapter 1, because he had been an eyewitness of Jesus in his life and even in his resurrection. And so now... They're taking this great boldness, and keep in mind, the religious leaders of the time, and we've already looked at this, are Sadducees. What are the three things they don't believe in? Resurrection, angels, and spirits, right? So you go, is it going to take a boldness to openly make these statements about the resurrection of Jesus? I mean, it's almost like, well, let's just start with where we differ. That's kind of the opposite of the way we normally go about life, isn't it? We try to find the common ground first and then build the relationship, and then you go from there. They're like, look, we're going to tell you the resurrection's everything. And the reason it is, nobody else can make that claim. You really want to make a claim to be in the king of the kingdom of God. If you want to really make a claim to be the one who created everything, he says, then death can't be master over you. And your life will have to end in resurrection and then in ascension. Now, they're making these, these great testimonies, witnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. I just kind of soak that statement in. Typically tell me how you define grace. Something you don't deserve, but you get anyway. Any other terms or any other phrases come to mind? All right. Undeserved favor, unmerited favor. Grace. You're given something you, you don't deserve, you haven't earned. It is a pure gift. So how do you describe abundant grace? You know, grace is already that above and beyond aspect, isn't it? And then to go, then to add, an abundant grace was upon them. And you go, <laughs> like, this is so massive, how do you even describe it? Now, he makes a statement, so you know it's true, but you realize, like, maybe you've had this experience in life where whatever's going on in life, not only are things taken care of, but then they get taken care of to such an extent that you realize, like, I'm taken care of so well that I should be looking out for other people, not just myself. And you go, wow, this is so big, so big. But of course, this is not just physical things. This is more so the spiritual side of things. He says, an abundant grace was upon them all. And I don't know if them all is just the apostles or if them all is everybody in verse 32, the whole congregation. I think it could go either way. Then look at verse 34. Look at the outcome. He says, for there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as they had need. Notice, who's not among them? There's not a needy person among them. Now, typically when you see that there's no need, do you respond? 
I'll just give you a little for instance. If we had one of the um, uh, children's homes or missions show up and they gave the report about how things are going, how the Lord's really showing them grace through, through what they're doing for him, and they just kind of finished by saying, we don't need any more money. We don't need any more support. We have everything taken care of. We have no needs whatsoever. Do you go, oh, man, well, i got to make sure I give them something. We typically go, well, that's a first. <laughs> but here's what I want you to see. These people were so much of one heart and one soul that no one was left behind. There wasn't anybody needy. It doesn't mean that there wasn't people who had a need, but they were taken care of. Now, he says there was not a needy person among them, and here's why. Here, here's the reason why that's the case. He says, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale. Now, look at that. Out of that little phrase, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales, which word really gets your attention? Just out of that phrase, anything stick out? All of them. There are other words that stick out too, don't get me wrong. But but to look at it and go, remember, they're all of one heart, one soul. So whenever they do things, they do it all together as one. Isn't that a wonderful, grand picture of unity? And it's all based around the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, here they are. And I want to kind of kind of bring this up again. He says in verse 35, and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. So people would sell their land, would sell houses. Now keep in mind, we're talking about within Jerusalem, Judea, perhaps. Did you really own your land? Think, think Old Testament-wise here in terms of Jewish thinking. You own the land. Basically what you did is every 50 years you had Jubilee, so then everything reverted back to your inheritance of your family. So if you sold something, like if you sold uh, a tract of land, you were basically selling the, the produce or the crops, the harvest that would come off of that land times how many years are left until Jubilee. So if here we are 10 years till the Jubilee, I'm basically saying, I'm selling you this land for a price, knowing that you will harvest this land for 10 years. Because once we get to Jubilee, then the land goes back to its inherited places. If you've ever, if you've ever read through <laughs> the book of Numbers, and or, or even, no, really not Numbers, if you've ever read through Joshua, the taking of the land, and you get about halfway through the book, and then it starts to describe to you the layout of the inheritance of the land, and you go, whoo, this is getting old fast. I don't know where any of these places are. It's just chapter after chapter after chapter for this tribe and that tribe and this tribe and that tribe. And you go, why in the world does he spend so much time on this? Got any ideas? Because you're going to need it every 50 years. It was a very important document to them. It doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But to them, on the year of Jubilee, they're going, all right, let's get Joshua out. We'll lay it back out again, make sure everything's got its own, everybody gets their inheritance, their family inherited land back. So they're selling off crops. For houses, houses are a little bit different. If your house was in a walled city, like if you sold it, it was sold for good. It was not a jubilee thing that went back. Now, if you had a house that sat on land, then it would be reverted back in, in the year of jubilee every 50 years. You ever hear people talk about that? They say, oh, this is a jubilee edition of this. What does that mean? It's been 50 years. Uh, if you get to a, a 50th 
uh, wedding anniversary. It's a jubilee. It doesn't mean you're freed. It's just <laughs> jubilee. So just 50 years. So you, you start to kind of kind of notice as it, as it goes through to think, these people are really selling off quite a bit. And keep in mind of what they're saying. If I'm selling off 10 years worth of crops, what am I saying about God's ability to take care of me? I'm not worried. He's going to take care of me. And you go, that's pretty awesome. Because that's where they were. Now, also keep in mind, here they are. If you go, all right, this is AD 33. Well, by A.D. 70, what's going to happen to Jerusalem? It's going to be destroyed by the Roman army. So look at how God's taken care of them. You can sell it and get something, or you can hold on to it, and then in the end you get nothing. Isn't it amazing how God does that in our lives? Must be that abundant grace. Good point. Now, so when he makes these statements about selling, you know, owners of land and houses, it's sell them, bring the proceeds of the sales, lay them at the apostles' feet, and then it says, and they would be distributed to each one, to, to each as any had need. So were there some folks who had needs? But were those needs met? Yes. So taken care of. Now, it lays this out and kind of gives you this principle. Um, let's go take a look. Uh, look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'll just show you a principle that's at hand. It's an Old Testament principle from the wilderness. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 12. This was about helping to supply a need for the saints in Jerusalem. The churches of Macedonia had given money that would be taken down to take care of the needs that were there because of what was coming later. 2 Corinthians 8, 12. For if the readiness is present, he says, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. So does God expect you to take out a loan to give money to other people? No, this is not about, you know, giving something beyond what you actually have. Verse 13. For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. He says, don't let people talk you in. And I've heard a whole lot of schemes like this in the past. Um, even, even some religious groups about, hey, you know, we want to build a new building. Will you go take out a personal loan and then give the money to... to <laughs> what are you talking about? You mean money I don't have you want me to give? Yeah. No. So, so you kind of notice, there was, I'm not saying they were taking out loans, but here's the idea for them. Look, God's not looking for us to give what we don't have. He said, just be responsible for what you do have, what you have been given. He says, this is not to where all of a sudden it, it, it puts a heavy burden on you and lightens a load for somebody else. Verse, verse 14, at this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. You have a great ability to help, they have a great need. So, what's the response? Oh, I can help. And then he calls upon this quotation from Exodus chapter 16, verse 18, um, in verse 15 here. He says, as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. Now, that's kind of a little bit of a riddle if you don't know the backstory. He says, back in the wilderness, God provided manna. Six days a week. Of course, you weren't going to go out and gather on the Sabbath. So on Friday, you would gather twice as much, and it would last through the weekend for those two days. And then you could go back out on the first day of the week and gather again. Well, you were supposed to take, it's called a homer or an omer, uh, for each person that lived in your house. Well, they're not walking around out in the wilderness, each of them have a pair of scales and going, okay, well, a little, little, too much, too little. They would kind of eyeball it, is what I would say. And, but then whenever they'd come back home, they'd go, you know what, we gathered too much. And then they might look next door, and maybe the family next door gathered too little. So what would you do? 
oh, here you go, we got too much. Now here's the other side of it. Typically, other than on Friday and Saturday or Friday and the Sabbath, if you kept manna for a day, what would happen to it the next day? It would go bad. So did it do you any good to keep it? So what was the point? Be on the lookout. Somebody might need it. It's not going to do you any good anyway. Now, let's kind of make a little bit more of a jump. Money right now, what's it going to do for you in eternity? It's going to burn. <laughs> and you start thinking of things, that's probably not the typical way we think of monetary things, of going, you know, why am I keeping this stuff? I know we keep a little, and that's not wrong. But, but to look at it and go, you know what, this really is not a great benefit um, in terms of just holding on to it. And so you look at this and go, do I look at it the same way that they looked at manna to go, you know what, there's a need, and I have the ability to fill that need because I have an abundance? Um, maybe you're somebody who, maybe you're just a, you enjoy cooking, baking, um, and you decide, you know what, you start mixing up the bowl of stuff, and you go, oh, let's put in a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that, and all of a sudden you're looking around, and you're like, you know what, we got 10 dozen cookies here. There is no way our family of four or six or two or whatever is going to ever go through that many cookies. Well, guess what? You got extra manna. What do you do with it? Try and give it away. And then people go, well, I don't need any either. <laughs> You just kind of know, it's, it's a manna principle. That, that's, that's the only thing I know to call it. And that's exactly the way that these, these saints in Jerusalem were thinking. And they weren't just thinking in terms of baked goods or, you know what, we got more beef that we're going to eat for a year, so let's give a little bit of this away or, or chicken, whatever. And you go, let's lay this out. It's just a manna principle. So come back over to, to Acts chapter, chapter 4. It went so far for them, being of one heart, one mind, that they said, you know what, we're wanting this physical thing too. If I have an abundance and you have a need, my responsibility is, I'm, I'm going to try and take care of that. And it may be a bigger need than what one person can handle. Maybe there's a whole bunch of people who, who go after it and do it. Here they were. They were laid this down at the apostles' feet, and it would be distributed to each as any had need. And if you kind of notice... It wasn't so much that the apostle says, whew, this is too much for us to do. We're going to get to that in chapter 6. That's going to be a different story. That's about food. But you come to it here, and just look at these last two verses. I want you to notice just two verses is enough to tell you a little, bit, a little picture of what's going on. Verse 36. It says, Acts 4, 36. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Sound pretty simple? Certainly. What's, what's a little funny here is whenever he gets introduced in the beginning of verse 36 as Joseph, we go, well, who's this guy? I've never heard of a Joseph before, other than Jesus' father. That's definitely not this, this Joseph. Because then it points out he's a Levite. Let's see. Does he understand biblical Old Testament principles? Might he know the manna, the, the manna sinking? He says, and he's of Cyprian birth. Anybody know what a Cyprian birth is? Don't say Caesarean because it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, he's from the island of Cyprus. Cyprus is a, it's, it's a pretty good sized island in the Mediterranean Sea. It's not too far off the coast there of modern-day Turkey, and, you know, Greece is a little bit further uh, west of there. And I actually did a little bit of math. If you were to cut Missouri into 20 pieces, then that's about the size of the island of Cyprus. So it, it's not real big, but it's 3,500 square miles. It's, it's big enough. And so this is where he's from, a Levite. Named Joseph, but nobody calls him Joseph. And you'll never hear another story through the rest of Acts where he's called Joseph. He's always going to be called by his nickname. You ever had somebody that you've known only by their nickname 
And then all of a sudden, they maybe they pass away, and you go, I don't even <laughs> know a name to look up. Because you've only known them by that name all their life. And so uh, you realize these things still happen. He says, so his nickname, and notice who gave him the nickname? The apostles called him Barnabas. And Barnabas, of course, means son of encouragement. And typically, whenever you see that B-A-R prefix in the New Testament, it means son of. Um, maybe you can... There's a story of a blind man when Jesus was on the earth and says that his name was Bartimaeus. Then it explains it, the son of Timaeus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you ever wonder where that comes from, now you know. And it's, it's consistent um, as it goes through. So his name's Barnabas, or his nickname's Barnabas, and realize the son of encouragement. Think about, here's the spiritual leaders and the apostles and they see Barnabas, and you go, man, every time we're around Barnabas, he's just an encouraging guy. Barnabas is one of those guys that whenever we get to be together with all the saints in the presence of God forever, I'm looking forward to meeting Barnabas. <laughs> I just, he's the kind of guy that if you get to sit down at a table with, it seems like he'd be a guy you'd want to be around. Just, just an encourager. And you, you know people in, in life who are just, that's just, they're just encouragers. Well, that was Barnabas. He's just an encourager. And later on down the line, you're going to see that's who Paul's going to pick to go with him on his first missionary journey. That should tell you something about Barnabas. He's just an outstanding man. Now, I want to go ahead and give away a little bit. Look over at Acts chapter 11. Look at verse 24. Just, just so that you get a good, a good feel for, for who Barnabas is. I'm not going to call him Joseph anymore. Now you know him. Look down... Look down at verses, well, i got to get the name. Look at verse 22, Acts 11, 22. This is, this is about Paul and Barnabas. Verse 22, the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Verse 23, then when he, Barnabas, arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to, surprise, surprise, what does he do? Encourage them all with resolute heart to, re to remain true to the Lord. doesn't matter where Barnabas goes, he's always the same. He encourages, not just at home, whenever he goes on the road. He, he's just an encourager. But look at the way he's described in verse 24. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. What do you see about Barnabas? What is it that really encourages people? His character is good. Notice what else about him. He's full of the Holy Spirit. So is he going to do things in a spiritual way? Does he let the physical things get in the way very much? He's going to make mistakes. But, but you notice it here. You go, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. You ever encounter people who are just full of faith? They can get into the worst type situations and they still are responding out of faith. What does it do to your heart? Does it not encourage you? Because you go, man, I'm not dealing with half the things that, that lady or that, or that man's dealing with, and they got a better attitude than I do. And that's encouraging. I, I need to realize how great our God is and know that he'll take care of me. Now, so you just kind of notice a little bit about Barnabas. And sure enough, come back over to Acts chapter 4. He's telling you kind of in generality, verses 32 through 35, about what was going on with these houses and tracts of land. There's only one person who's given by name of doing it in a way that is positive. You go, ooh. And it just so happens to be Barnabas, because you're going to run to Barnabas a lot through the rest of the book of Acts. So there's your introduction to Barnabas. Now, he, he sold the tract of land, brought it, laid the money at the feet of the apostles. Chapter 5 opens up. What's the first word in the chapter? Isn't that a funny way to start? You know, typically whenever you read through a, a regular old chapter book, it's pretty seldom for the first word of the chapter to be, but... 
like, oh, I, I kind of wonder if maybe a better chapter break, you know, maybe chapter 5 started back at verse 32 and then kind of went down through verse 11 of chapter 5, if that wouldn't have been a, a little bit better break of ideas coming together. But, hey, they did a great job. They did it with a long time ago. So, so you notice chapter 5 opens up. But a man named, <laughs> excuse me, but a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. Just told you about Barnabas. Let me tell you about encouraging, full of faith, good man Barnabas. But. <laughs> and then gets introduced Ananias and Sapphira. Now, let me just give you a little help here. In, in, in Greek, typically, a name actually has a meaning that goes with it. Um, it's not always given in the scripture, but you can. there's ways to go back and look it up. You already know the story, I think, here. So I'm not really giving anything away too much. But I want you to, to realize the name Ananias, do you think it's going to be a positive meaning or a negative meaning? You would expect it to be negative because you've read the rest of the story, and I'm glad you have. But Ananias literally means in the Greek, it means Yah, Jehovah, has been gracious. Now, imagine having a name that anytime people would say it, they would know the meaning of basically God has been gracious. Hmm, that seems like a pretty good name. Apparently, his parents wanted to let him, God has been gracious. May make you think about what their situation was, but that's his name. And typically, whenever you get names, and this is not all the time, sometimes whenever you look up the names, it gives you a little bit of extra insight into what's going on in the story. There's a lot of times where it doesn't give you us a name and we want one so badly. We go, oh, I wish I knew who, what that name was. Don't wish it too much. It might lead us astray. But Ananias means uh, God or Yah, Jehovah, has been gracious. Sapphira. I'm not going to make you guess on this one. Negative or positive? You've already seen the trend. Well, Sapphira literally means precious or beautiful. Maybe this should give us a little bit of, a, of an insight to Ananias and Sapphira. How are they seen by other people? It's good. Uh, precious, beautiful, God has been gracious. And here's how they get introduced in the chapter. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, verse 2, and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Oh, this seems normal so far, right? Except for the part of kept back. Kept back some of the price for himself. And notice who else is in on this deal. His wife. If the, either one of them working off the same heart and soul that we saw earlier. No. No. They're working off a of self. Now, get back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. This is one of those situations where we should see marriage and go, somebody's got to stand up and do what's right. Sometimes then a marriage, maybe it's a husband, maybe it's a wife, starts to go down a wrong path. And this is one of those stories where if either one of them would have stood up and said, you know, this isn't right could have changed the outcome of the story. But it didn't. Now, full knowledge, it says, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Who did, at this point in the story, other than the part about keeping back for yourself, at this point in the story, on the outside, doesn't Ananias look just like Barnabas? Yeah, but what do you know? He's not. Now, Things on the outside can look one way. But what's going on, on the inside? Let's see. Heart and soul are on the outside or inside? Inside. 
He says, here they come. Now, he lays it at the apostles' feet. Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? Oh. He didn't tell anybody. Peter knew it. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Who's working in the heart of Ananias? Satan. What happens when we get away from wanting to go after spiritual things, holy things, righteous things? Who are we opening up the door to? Satan to come in. And if you notice, on the outside, how did Ananias look? He looked righteous on the outside. He looked just as encouraging as... Barnabas, who was the real deal, he says, to keep back some of the price of the land. Now, we'll, we'll kind of deal with this as we go through. And I'll show you. When he talks about the price, he's talking about the whole price. And you'll see this as we go through the story. Verse 4, Well, it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? Did anybody force you? Did you have to sell it? To be righteous? No. He says, and after it was sold, was it not under your control? He says, and even after you sold it, was it not still your own? He says, okay. He says, why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. What, just in seeing the, the conversation, the verses 3 and 4, what is the major problem? his heart, and he lies. Now, he says, when it remained unsold, it was yours. Even after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? Conceive, two things coming together. If I sell the land and I act like I gave my all, what's it going to look like to other people? Well, I look just like Barnabas. Everybody loves Barnabas. I want to be loved like Barnabas is. You can see it be conceived, can't you? I don't know that exactly. But it definitely looks like Ananias is more concerned about the outside than he is the inside, isn't he? And notice, who's allowed to come in when we care more about the peripherals and the views on the outside looking in than we do about really having a heart and soul for Jesus? Satan, that's where he comes in. Now, then, he says, you have not lied to men, but to God. I want you to kind of start making a little list here. Verse 3, lied to who? Holy Spirit. Verse 4, not lied to men, but to God. Verse 5, and as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and a great fear came over all who heard of it. That was the last thing Ananias heard. He didn't get much of a chance to repent, did he? Sometimes you don't always get much of a chance. That's why you have to be concerned all the way along. Now, here's something else as it pops up. And great fear came over all who heard of it. Because wouldn't it make you want to look on the inside of ourselves? Is there anything I do that's just for the external? Anything I do to be seen as better by others? Hmm. Now, notice it's not just fear, it's a great fear. Came over all who heard of it. But there's one person who doesn't hear of it. Won't they guess who? His wife. Now, and you'll see how long it's been. Verse, verse 6, he says, The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Just that fast. All of a sudden, Sapphira's husband is already buried before she ever knows anything. Now, verse 7. Here's the time frame. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Her husband died three hours ago. She knows nothing about it, and he's already buried. Now comes a time 
come face to face in the mirror. Verse 8, And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the lamb for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Said, Did you sell it for this, this price? Yeah. Remember, she's been on it. They've been on the same page. It's an evil page, but they're on the same page. And what little curious detail do you wish you knew? How much they sell it for? <laughs> now, I just want you to kind of take a moment here to recognize, sometimes when you're not given the details, the next thing is to go, why am I not given that detail? It doesn't matter. What if it was a small amount? What if it was a large amount? I want you to see it's the principle that's of value here, not the value itself. Because some people would go, well, man, they were struck dead and they sold it for $3 million. Well, I've never, I'm not, I don't know anything that big, so it must not be too bad, is it? See how people would justify themselves and be just as wrong. So whenever it doesn't give you a value, realize it's because that's not the principle of the story. Just like sometimes not giving a name is not the principle of the story. So, he makes, uh, he makes a statement. He says, tell me, did you sell the land for such and such a price? He said, yes, that was the price. Verse 9, then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Now, who's the Lord? Not a trick question. Who's the Lord? Jesus. Now, who is being put to the test? The Spirit of Jesus. You see how this little checklist, why have you lied to this Holy Spirit of God? You haven't lied to men, you've lied to God. Why are you testing the Spirit of the Lord? There's Jesus. You go, these things are not just like, oh, it's just one. Like This stands in complete opposition to who God is. What are you thinking about God the Father, God the Son, or God the Spirit? Now, I want you to look at the rest of verse 9, and then I'm going to ask you a question. He says, Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. How did Peter know that she was about to die? Just think about it for a moment. How does Peter know that? I want you to think about the principle at hand. Is God partial? No. So, you are in this together. And if that's the penalty for one, then it's going to be the penalty for the other. Now, he knew, you know what, because of the impartiality of God, now, Notice, did she have a chance? He, he asked the question, did you sell it for such and such a price? She could have said, my husband told me I'm supposed to tell you that is the answer, but that's not what happened. Would it have changed? Sure seems like it, doesn't it? I, I can't tell you that true outcome there, but, but to go, sometimes the opportunity is just that small. But yet, it is still an opportunity given. She has no idea. She doesn't know that Ananias is dead. She doesn't know that Ananias has been buried. And she doesn't know that she's about to join him. Now, because if she knew that part, surely she would have changed her answer. Now, but maybe not. So, Verse 9, Behold the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. Sometimes I think about these young men going, oh. <laughs> I was really pulling for repentant heart there. <laughs> we just buried one, now we've got to go bury another. But that's not the point. Uh, verse 10, And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. They were buried side by side. 
They were together in this all the way. From the inception of the thought to being buried side by side. Not that being buried side by side is a terrible thing. Just talking about emphasis here. Now, here it comes through, verse 11. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Can you understand why great fear came in? What happens when people get esteemed in a congregation of the Lord's people, but their heart's not in it? It's just something that's on the outside. And then here's a judgment that comes down. And you easily realize, no wonder. He says, a great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Everybody. Because what do they now recognize that Jesus sees, that God sees? He sees the heart, the soul, the motive. And if you're not going to go after what's holy and righteous, I mean, this is like, wow. It took them, it seems like anybody who heard of them went, ooh, I better be careful about my heart. I better be careful about what my motives are. Or otherwise, I might have some young men coming in to grab me next. Now, here they were, and you kind of take quick note of that. And so, you know, the book's going to kind of take a little bit. It, it's going to expand upon this going forward, uh, starting in verse 12. And uh, next, next week, Brent will be back, and he'll, he'll teach you in, in December. I think we only have like two or three classes in December, and then we'll have our, our break. So keep that in mind. Any questions before we end? Donna. Okay. Correct. And that's, and if you notice, and every time it goes through this story, and that's the little thought I got a little jotted down here that I forgot to mention. Whenever it says price, like verse 2, you start going down through, as it continues on, on through the whole story, when it brings up price, that Greek word for price is the idea of, and we, we even see like proceeds. And whenever we see that word, we go, proceeds are, you know, the things that go above and beyond what it took to actually, you know, have it. But even that word is the same for price. And the word literally means the price paid in full or received. That word, we would say the grand total. That, that's the way we would probably typically make that, that made. So anytime you see in these verses, and it says price was the grand total, this. That's what they're being asked. And anytime they say, yes, lie, yes, lie, over and over again. So maybe that helps clear up that, that thought. Because that was one I had, and I intended to tell you that along the way. But <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll try to do better. Anything else? That's right. Fear came over. <laughs> grab, grab, the earthquake grabs your attention after the prayer. So, all right. Don't forget to sign. All right. Have a good week.